You're listening to Voice Actor Showcase, episode number 32. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Voice Actor Showcase, a podcast about voice actors and their stories. I'm Jun Yoon. Please connect with us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Voice Actor Show. These episodes are also available on youtube.com slash voicemoto. Now, the Voice Actor Showcase is about the stories of voice actors from around the world who are working hard every day at different places in their individual journeys. And if you have an interesting story and you've been thinking about converting your walk-in closet into a closet booth for quite some time now, I'd love to have you on the show to share your story. Please contact us by visiting voiceactorshowcase.com. And while you're there, please check out the store and pick up an introverted voice actor t-shirt or a Get Mike, Get Money, Get Tacos t-shirt for yourself or your favorite voice actor. The sales from the store will go to supporting the show as well as paying the voice actors in future episodes. Today, we'll meet a voice actor from Jacksonville, Florida. Despite the numerous overwhelming challenges that he had faced throughout his life, he has always found a way to push forward. He's a true testament to the human spirit. The relentless pursuit of happiness for himself and others, the brave heart of a champion, genuine cheerleader of those around him, and a person of respect, integrity, kindness, and empathy. The start of his journey in the voice acting realm was rather recent, but in this very short time, he has managed to achieve some really great milestones and continues to soar today. He's the voice of Zetsu in Lionheart Paragon, Tesla in Cybermania, and Pocket in Danganronpa F Shattered Hope by Shattered Hope Studios. We'll hear about his tumultuous past, his story of overcoming his challenges, and where he plans to go from here. Please welcome my good friend, Josh Portillo. <laughs> I'll do the one thing that makes me happy. Time to record. Let's get ready to rumble! Ladies and gentlemen, we have a slobberknocker of a match tonight. Snake, are they going to kill each other? Relax, they're not going to kill anyone. I got money on this game. Go, 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 punishment time. Come here. Bring it. No, 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 Josh Portillo. Hello, sir. How are you? Welcome to the show. I'm so glad to have you here. Hello. How are you doing? I'm Uh, doing fine. I am am, kind of tired, but um, I think that's just, you know, life. So I think we're good. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you're supposed to be tired in life. So I think think that we're we're good. (laughs) If you're tired, that means you're putting in effort. So that's good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's jump into it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Now, I I typically ask, I want you to know, that everybody that comes on here about their childhood, right? What kind of kid they were, what kind of activities they liked to do, um, what the, their family were like, and so on and so forth. Now, among the happy and bright days that you've had, you've also lived through some really dark ones as well. I have. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like you to talk to us about your childhood first. Sure. What, tell us about what kind of kid little Josh was. And then from there, um, let's just have you tell us the story about you growing up? Sure. Well, first of all, um, little Josh was actually big Josh back then, and he still is. <laughs> uh, growing up, it was it was interesting. Uh, I mean, being 25 now, I will say this first and foremost, that um, I try to remember the good things. I try to remember the, um, the good things about my childhood. And, you know, growing up, it was kind of there were hard times, um, and I'm not trying to say like, oh, it was dramatic or, you know, all these terrible things happened. No, it's everybody goes through some sort of some sort of issue, whether it be domestic violence or just maybe their parents aren't home a lot. Everybody has their issues and everybody has their situations that they go through and they all hold a, a significant weight to them. You know, there's no sort of like, like, oh, I went through more than you or that sort of thing. So I just want to say that first and foremost, because I know that there are kids out there that went through more than me. And I want to, you know, I always think about that. And I always think like maybe 
uh, while back then I would have thought like, oh, why is this happening to me? Nowadays, I think like it's not as bad as it as it can be, if that makes any sense, June. Yeah, I think it does. Yeah. Going into more detail, I kind of went off the rail there. Uh, growing up, it was it was eh <laughs> at times. Um, <laughs> and uh, it all comes from like history. So like I know my mom uh, moved around a lot. Uh, she was a military brat. Uh, my dad grew up in a more rougher type of environment. You know, um, my granddad kind of raised him and his two brothers in like a, in a tougher sense, um, Mm. so to say. And my dad kind of adopted that unknowingly. Sometimes you can't see, you know, without somebody telling you and no one ever told him. And honestly, looking back now, it's not, it really wasn't his fault, so to say. I mean, he didn't really have the mentors like I have. So I wish he had that. Yeah. Yeah. My childhood was really, you know, up until the age of four, it was nice. Um, We would just play, me and my dad would just play games together. Um, My mom, me and my mom would watch movies together. You know, the typical, typical family stuff. Yeah. And it, it really all just changed when, you know, like the stuff that happens behind the scenes just, you know, showed itself to me. Um, I remember one time. I believe it was in the month of March of 1999. My dad was had gotten in like a fight at work and stuff like that. It wasn't really a good night. And I remember my mom, she got like a really eerie call from him um, from work. And apparently he was drinking and all that kind of stuff. And he thought that he was, or excuse me, that she was like cheating on him or that sort of thing. And she was just like, okay, honey, uh, I don't, really know what you're talking about. I'll just, you know, um, I'll see you when you get home. And he comes home at around 3 a.m. Um, we wake up. I still remember the steak dinner that she made him. Um, it was on a wooden table in the living room. And he comes in and my dad has like this terrible look on his face. Like I've never seen anything like it. His eyes were almost red. His face was red. And he was just like mad. And I just remember him like going up to my mom and my mom is just like, like, oh, well, what's going on? She was like kind of wobbling a little bit. Like she was kind of like scared. And then all of a sudden just like, bam, 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 just started like hitting her and everything. Haymakers and all that kind of stuff. I remember he was on top of her at one point. Cause I like, after a few seconds, I walked in between the living room and the kitchen and, um, you know, of course, I was four years old at the time and my heart was beating and my brain was processing like a thousand ideas through my head, like in the span of like two minutes. And I know now that a kid is not supposed to think that fast yeah. or process that type of thing at that age. And I just remember my mom was holding back a knife uh, that my dad was trying to, you know, do the do and do, do the do the deed, I guess. I, I don't know. Um, I'm just trying to make it sound no, lighthearted, it's... but I don't think you can make that lighthearted. It's just, he was just trying to do that. And I remember my mom holding, her, holding him back and just looking over to me and going like, Josh, go to your room, go to your room. Don't look, don't look. Oh. The thing is, I looked, I watched, and I can still remember it. Um, even... Uh, 21 years later, I can still remember it. And uh, I got so scared. I went underneath my Lion King blanket. I still remember that. And um, I stood, I, I went under there for about 15 to 20 minutes, got out un, from under the covers, saw that my whole house was basically like ruined. They were still fine in the back. Uh, and then apparently the neighbors beside us next door heard my mom's cries and they called the police my mom takes me Mm -hmm. um and we didn't know that somebody called the police we did not know that uh so we just like we're gonna leave the house it was scary too because later on i found out like my dad had a gun too so if you like had any like if he had grabbed that in his rage that he was in i i don't know man i Wow. It, <laughs> it's scary to think about. Right when we got out of the house, the police were there and they took my dad away. And I, 
looking back, I mean, I'm not perfect. I, I like, I get angry at God because uh, I am a believer and I get angry at God at times. And, you know, and I kind of, I question at times, but if I ever need an example or like a clear vision of him existing, <laughs> that was him that night because like p- for the police to just be right there when we went out the door uh, that's a miracle in my eyes but from then on it just kind of changed like my whole outlook on my childhood kind of changed like I saw more of how my dad acted I saw more about how my mom kind of like reacted wow. and um just was sad yeah uh, a lot of stuff, lot, a lot of little stuff, a lot of domestic stuff happened after that. Like my dad, first of all, didn't remember that night. He only got like two days of jail, which back then I was very angry about. And then, you know, just little things. And the, the sick thing is there were nice times after that. And I say that's sick because it could, it just intermingled with the bad and then the bad outweighed the good. And then it's just like, You hear about these certain times when like your own father was like, you know, trying to kill your mom, like behind your back or like make her life a living hell, excuse my language. But it it just makes it even worse in my, in my opinion and in my situation I was in, it was just like two face almost like you try to be all lovey, lovey, dovey and all that in front of me. And then when I'm at school, you're like making her quit her job my mom's job, making her quit her job. And like, it's either him or the job, that sort of thing. And what made it, what made it like more of a, of an issue was people saw him as like a good guy. And he, maybe he was, I like, I can't judge him on that, uh, but it's just funny seeing the dualities between like, you know, being in front of people and then who you really are. You can be a good actor, but you can't act in front of like your family and such. And it just got to the point when I was younger, about like when I was 13, you know, when you have, whenever you live in a situation like that with, you know, not a lot of good influences. Also, I was bad at making friends. I remember failing the fourth grade and that sucked. And um, I was like the biggest one in the class too. So I, I'd had some body shaming um, issues as well. By the sixth grade, I was 345 pounds. I wanted to die. I did not know what I was doing. And I felt like, what's the point in living anymore? What's the point in doing anything? Like, no one likes me. Friends who, who, friends who did appreciate me, I did not know they appreciated. I will make that clear. I did have friends but I did not know they appreciated me. And also kids can be kids. I mean, it's kids can say cruel things, but at the end of the day, they're still your friends. And then like later on, like in life, like now they'll be like, you know, oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that. I'm so sorry, that sort of thing. But back then it was hard to realize that, especially for me. And then, you know, after opening up to my mom around that age and really kind of immersing myself and seeing like, this is how he's treating her. And then, you know, seeing how, how I've been affected by it. Like, I remember I did not attempt, I did not like go through with it, but I contemplated and played with the idea of suicide. I remember putting the same knife that my dad tried to use to kill my mom right at my face twice while my mom was sleeping at the age of eight. And for some reason, I just heard a voice in my head saying, Josh, it is not your time. Like you, you, you still got stuff to do. You can't leave. And I got mad back then. And then I would get even more mad, uh, after gaining a bunch of weight and such. And it's just like, why can't I go? Why can't I die? Um, I'm sick of acting. I'm sick of acting. I'm sick of acting happy. I'm sick of acting like everything's okay because nothing's okay. And uh, once I started to see like my mom and started and started to see just everything and how my anger was building up at this point, I was just going to rip through everybody. Like that's how I felt, how angry I was. Something inside me just said, 
you got to change somehow or you're going to die. Like you are literally going to die. Like, do you really want to do that? Like you say you want to, but do you really want to like stop acting and start, you know, being real with yourself? And I remember the coaches in my middle school said, hey, you should join football. So I did. And long story short, because there's a lot of details I can go with. Uh, my coach helped me lose a bunch of weight my first year. He helped mm. me lose 145 in seven months. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. It was a lot of work. It was like two a days every single day. And I just fell in love with training. Yeah, That's the reason why I like... I wish I can, get, I can give better content, but <laughs> that's why I do like the little workout bits because it's just like, you know, anything I can do to help, yeah. like I, I'll do that. And anybody who's willing to try out or try, you know, to get a better lifestyle, it just takes a little bit of, of a push. And I hope I can give that push. But that's what I got a lot um, when I was about 14 of losing that weight. And then my coach told me, he's like, Josh, you got to do what God is leading you to do. And I knew exactly what he was talking about. Mm. And of course, at a young age, you can always be immature with your goals. Um, I, I always, uh, I would think to myself back then, I would just be like, I'm going to get revenge on my dad and I'm going to take him down and I'm going to save my mom. Uh, It's just like like something from like an anime or a manga, which again, uh, it sounds epic when you're younger, but then as you get older, you're kind of like, all right, there has to be a, a smarter way to do this. Work smarter, not harder. But I did not do that. I remember getting into a, a private Christian school, very nice, really good opportunity, got led to Christ there, which was great. Yeah. Uh, as you can see, I cursed, so I'm not perfect. Just telling that to everybody. <laughs> I am not a perfect man. Um, I will admit to that. And uh, I, I had this idea in my head that if I got a football scholarship, I could take my mom with me <sighs> and we can just leave. I can just get her out of that situation. Yeah. It, and there were other stuff in the behind the scenes that kind of made it like even more like that made sense. It just made sense at that point that that, w- that could be the goal and that's the way it could, it could go. Yeah. But I worked towards that goal. Um, I remember working out two times, three times, sometimes four times a day. Wow. Just that was my goal. Uh, along with high school drama, <laughs> there's always that. Um, sure. Yeah. yeah. But besides that, that was always in the back of my head. And I remember during my junior year, I got a torn ACL. And then in my senior year, I got two torn ACLs, which made the goal even harder to achieve. <laughs> and um, if anybody's uh, just, you know, watches sports and everything, a torn ACL is very, it's v- very daunting. It can be like the end of your career. That's it's it's a very serious injury. And I remember I made the decision to play with both of them unfixed my senior year. Oh my goodness. Cause it's like, this is your final chance. This is this is it. You it's it is do or die. Like you have to make this happen. You know, and at the time my mom was losing a lot of blood. I won't go into detail with that, but she was losing a lot of blood um, and uh, she was not very healthy. I remember helping her walk to the bathroom and back and she said she would, felt like she was, she just ran a marathon. And I just, you know, thinking about that kind of stuff, it's just like, oh my gosh, you know, I got to get this done. And of course I didn't because colleges don't like they don't want a kid, an 18-year-old kid who has two ACL tears that have not been fixed and literally can't do anything about it. <sighs> My goodness. Fun fact, they are still not fixed, but the doctors say that it would not be, you know, it wouldn't help too much if they were fixed now because, you know, you're not doing sports or anything and it could do more harm or anything. I don't, I'm not going to... I'm not going to um, copy and paste that or anything, but yeah. So it was very hard wow. to see that. But, um, and I will not uh, say the names of the people uh, that helped me just for, you know, their, their privacy and such. Sure, sure. Um, but I had a 
good group of people that helped. I learned very, very quickly that uh, in my case, there is never a self-made man. You always get help uh, in some way and you always have to give credit where credit is due. They helped me out a lot. I remember I was staying at different people's houses during high school because I just could not stand my dad. He was like literally the Thanos of my life. I, I, I just wanted to snap him out of existence. Just like, I can't stand you. And uh, they helped me uh, save her. And I remember, all, I still remember when um, uh, we stole my dad's car oh. and my <laughs> mom and I drove up to North Carolina and, uh, you know, explained the whole situation to my grandparents up there. Yeah. Um, and then after that, after a few more complicated, you know, turnarounds and such, I remember wishing her off at the uh, Greyhound station. Ever since then, she's uh, she's been up there. She's married to my stepdad now. They got rid of a benign tumor that was making her bleed a lot, oh. which was the size of like a baby. Whoa. Which that, like, I felt in my gut that we were on a time limit the last four years while I was in high school. And I was like, seeing that, I was like, oh my gosh. Like, Whoa. I was actually right. We were on a time limit. Um, so... Just seeing that, that was good um, that she got rid of that. <sighs> and I'd made peace with my dad. I went to see him and uh, he cried in my arms whenever I saw him after everything that had happened. He cried in my arms. He's like, I'm just glad you're okay. Is your mom okay? I said, yeah, she's fine. And he's like, yeah, that's, I get it. You know, I, I'm glad she's good. I could see in his eyes that he knew why this all happened. And I'm going to I'm going to just interject here real quick cuz the issue of fathers and sons is is a really delicate issue and it's a, a a topic that's really personal to me. Um only because of my own uh, childhood experience of my father being same uh, yep. abusive and violent and drunk and all this stuff and and the guy my dad left when I, when I, when I the day I turned 18. And we saw each other a few times afterwards, but I haven't heard from him or communicated with him at all in decades now, literally decades. <laughs> and, and I don't plan to. Uh, the day he left was a very happy day for my, my, my mom and I. And, and I've never made the attempt to like, reconcile uh, with him, period. I just cut him out of my life and that was that. And you, I'll say this right now. I mean... Even though, even though, like the, these questions are pre-written, and I and I meant every word when I wrote this question, but I really think that you are a better man than I am because I will not forgive my father for for what he's done to me and my family. You know what I mean? And um, what a as if, as everyone who knows you on different different relationship based, whether it's online or or in person, knows that you're knows that you're a good person. And and this is this much is is proven by everyone, I think, by now. But how were you able to forgive your father? That's the part that I, I'm not going to understand, I'm sure. Well, first off, I think you're a strong man for admitting that you won't forgive because I a lot of people won't and I don't blame them. Um, I think it it's also takes a strong man to admit that kind of stuff. Like, I'm not going to forgive him. That that it's it takes strength to say that. Some people would fake it and say, "I don't know, I I don't know." No, be straightforward. You know that that's great. I like that. So, you know, you're strong in your in your own sense, June. Don't ever tell it. Don't let anybody else say that you're not strong because you are. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was of course it was my mother. Um, <laughs> my mother made me because uh, uh, she's like. Down the road, when you are a father yourself and when you have a wife and kid, do you want that on the back, uh, like like beating you behind your back, like that you never forgave your dad? Hmm. Like you have to take care of that, you know, for not just you, but for your future family. Um, and I said, <laughs> oh, damn, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Gosh, dang it. <laughs> so I, I saw him. I made peace with him. I did not want to. I see. I did not want to. Yeah. And there were times when I flaked out on him. I did. I ghosted him. I remember this one time where I stayed on the phone, and um, he was with a few people, and they were saying like, "Oh, he, he, you know, he's 
he doesn't want to be with you, Gino. He doesn't want to do that, blah, 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 blah. And my dad was, uh, yes, I eavesdropped. Um, because <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just curious. He was defending me the whole time. And by that point, I was like, well, one, I feel bad for eavesdropping now. <laughs> um, I'm not going to do that again. Two, my dad's really trying to change. Um, and uh, it was um, it was from then on, I was just like, okay, you know, God has led me back to Jacksonville because I was in college at in Lakeland for a little bit. And then for some reason, something tugged me back to Jacksonville um, where I live now, my hometown, because I was just like, something is telling me that I still have stuff to do here. And I go back that happens. I decide to make peace with him. I decide to really put effort into it. Um, and I remember this last thing that he told me. Um, one of the last things I remember him saying is, because I was, I was very greedy at one point, and I will be honest, I still am. And, he, and I was like, I want to be rich. I want to do all these things, blah, 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 blah. And he's just telling me, Josh, sometimes you need to just stop and smell the roses because you never know when they're going to be gone. And that really hit me. Um, it still hits me to this day because I'm just like, yeah, um, yeah. For the longest time, I wanted to steal those roses, so to say, from you. And in a way, it's like I did. And so it's just like, well, I'm here to mend now. And I remember we were going to fix food for all of my friends, him and I. And then this one random night in, I, it's, it's been a while now, it's been five years, uh, September or October, whenever, I totally forgot. Now, I know the anniversary is in November, but um, he passed away. And I was like, oh my God, I got my wish and I don't want it. It's funny whenever you whenever they say like like be careful what you wish for because for the longest time when I was younger since I was thirteen even when before that like I would have just like angry thoughts of just like I'm gonna freaking duh off my dad for everything he's done like I and then when you get older and you you're very immature you know those ambitions get you know they drive up. They like they rev up a little bit, and it's like I am going to do it somehow. I'm going to put this man out of existence, and now he is. And I still remember being at that funeral, and I remember my mom had come back down. She was crying on top of the dead body, all that stuff, and I was just standing there in the middle of the aisle, and I remember my friend uh, JB was with me. A bunch of my friends were there to support me. But I just remember me sit, standing right there. And for the longest for for the longest time now I've I always thought like, "Oh my gosh. Like I caused this." And um I went to I went to uh mental health counseling for a little bit got off of that. I was so angry and so like fed up with everything that I stopped going. I remember I was uh, staying at my friend's house and I would like, you know, I was crying on the couch when I was staying on. I was, you know, walking to my college and back, you know, in the morning and then at night crying there, crying back. For about a year and a half, I was just in the, in a, like, I, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Felt like forever, honestly. And then a counselor once told me, she's just like, you need to write a letter to your dad, go to the grave, burn it, and start from there. And so I did that. And from that point on, I was just like, okay, I got to get up. I got to get back on my feet. It's not going to be easy. Nothing is. So, you know, I tried to get more serious in school and uh, went back into the dorms because uh, I didn't want to, you know, bother the people I was staying with anymore. And just step by step, just started to, you know, kind of build back up to, you know, what do I want to do in life now? Because at the, for the longest time, I didn't know I was going to last this long. 
Um, I didn't know I was going to survive this long or honestly achieve the dream that I wanted for so long was to help my mom. That was it. Um, I thought from then on, I didn't think about the future. I didn't. And I just thought, what can I do? And then, you know, after, you know, helping out with a few operas, you know, and uh, doing a few acting classes and all that kind of stuff, I was just like, "Eh, acting would be fun. But being a person who's very insecure with their abilities and having confidence issues, I was just like, I can't handle that rejection or that sense of failure. I think I get that complex from when I was a little kid after failing the fourth grade. I I have that complex. And a friend of mine uh, introduced me to the Europa video game visual novel series. Ryan. Yes, Ryan. And um, very good voice actor. He actually, he's the one that's leading the charge on this whole like crusade for us to be uh, pros. Um, <laughs> of course, when you're a voice actor, and I will say this that everybody else, all the all the um, you know uh, people in the uh, in the Twitter verse, as I would say, has taught me is when you're a voice actor, you're a voice actor. That's that's plain and simple. Like you've committed, you're good. Um, now you just have to learn, 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 get the equipment, learn the audio, <laughs> learn, 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 and um, go from there. Yeah. But um, yeah, he got me into it. And then uh, really, I just started to like it and started to go at it more and more and more. And I'm like, huh, I like this. And then, you know, learning more about it, learning about narration, learning about, you know, dubs, of course. Um, learning that there's different stuff besides like, you know, acting and anime and uh, video games and such that, you know, there's other outlets as well. It just became more versatile and more interesting to me. And, you know, it's something I can see me myself doing in the future. And I plan on doing it in the, in the future. And it's the first thing really that I thought about doing really since I achieved that, that goal of, you know, helping my mom. Um, So it's just like, you know, you achieved that dream. Now you got to reset and go again. And now it's your turn. Yeah, exactly. It's your turn to go after what you want to do now that your mom has been helped and rescued. Yes. Yes. And I think that's what my dad would want. I know he's, I know he would be proud. Um, And at the end, I, I just wanted to say too, it's just like, you know, my parents, they did the best they could. Um, And I don't say that like, oh, they did the best they could. No, like, they they did good. I've made peace with that. Like, you know, no one's perfect. Of course, I don't support domestic violence or anything and all that. Of course not. Right. But I think I take a lot from uh, the Avengers movies, the superhero movies. I think that's what always drove me because uh, when I was younger, I always loved Iron Man. And one of the things that Tony Stark says in the last Avengers movies, in Endgame, he was talking to his dad and... He's like, I can only remember the best things or the good things. You know, it was a rough childhood, but I can only remember the good things. And I, tr- I try to do that. I try to take what Tony said in that movie and just say, it was rough, but you got to remember the good things. You know, remember, remember the roses, I guess. <laughs> um, make new ones. And of course, you know, give credit to all the friends and everybody that's helped you. Um, because again, with me, there is not, there is never a self-made man or girl, man or woman. And I'm really, and I'm really glad that you are here now with us today, you know, much healthier as, as best you are capable, as, as best you can be healthier, physically, mentally, emotionally, interacting with the community and really pursuing uh, what you want to do in the voice acting world. And I'm, I, <sighs> okay, this is going to come off really, really wrong. And I apologize. Yeah. No, you're fine. I'm, I'm not your dad, but I'm really <laughs> proud of you. <laughs> yeah. You know definitely. what I mean? And I'm sure everybody who's listening, who's listened to your story so far can, can behind me, can get behind me hundred percent. We're, we're super duper proud of you for surviving this far and having come this far, being as successful as you are this far. What? Not many people out there have the courage and, and, and the heart to be where you are today 
after having gone through what you've gone through. And I think that's, I think that needs to be mentioned and celebrated and, thank and commended. Thank you. Thank you. And if I could, um, if I can answer to that again, thank you. You know, there's, there's one character, you know, and you mentioned surviving, you know, there's, there's surviving and you can thrive along with that, of course. And there's one character I always look up to in uh, anime and such is Guts from Berserk. Uh, reason being, yeah, it's not because he wields a sword or anything like that. It's not because he's, you know, he's this hulking, you know, brute that goes around and takes down, you know, demons or like bad people or anything like that. In the story of Berserk, fate has always played against Guts. And um, I was just kind of related to that a little bit. And I think a lot, of course, a lot of other people can too, because people live in some of the, you know, ugliest circumstances, you know, and at some point, you know, and I have too, I've thought like, this is what fate has laid upon me. This is my path. And I always thought now it's just like, no, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be bad. You can change the tone of your story. It doesn't have to be all sad and terrible all the time. No, it, it can be inspirational. It can be positive. It can be, of course, you're going to have your down times, but it doesn't have to be, you know, ugly all the time. And I just, that's why I look up to that character guts is because, you know, throughout the whole story, you know, they call him the struggler. Besides the black swordsman, they call him the struggler because he struggles against fate. He wants to achieve his own life, his own um, free will. And, you know, I really do believe that. And I really do appreciate that. And that's why, I tr that's what I try to mimic, of course, while keeping my, keeping my faith in God, which can be hard at times. I'll be honest. Um, there are a lot of people who put on faces, put on fake faces and say like, I, you know, I worship God and all that kind of stuff. And then you see them do terrible things. I ain't perfect by any means. I curse, I lust. I do all those things. But what you'll get from me is like, you know, me saying is God has a plan. God has given us choices. And what we have to do is make the right ones and be good, have a good heart and be true to people while on that path of, you know, whatever we want to do um, and also help people give back. And I mean, kind of going, kind of going, going along with that idea that through help, through your faith in God and all the other forces that exist in the universe, like other supporters and friends and fans, you've come a long way. I mean, let's let's talk about that, the, your successes <laughs> and your achievements, which there are a lot. And personally, I as as I as I investigated you for these questions that I've created, um, I first went to your casting call page, ca casting call club page. Yeah. And the voice actors that are listening know about the num the recommendation system that they have on there. And you've got 17 of them. And every single one, of course, high praises of your work ethics and personality and, and talent. And every single one mentioned hardworking, friendly, reliable, dependable, all these things. And just, just talking with you, right, for Mr. Voice Actor, for various interactions on Twitter that we've done, and just pre-production for this podcast, I... I I would agree. I've, I've taught theater for many years. I know a friendly, <laughs> hardworking, reliable actor when I see one. You know what yeah. I mean? Yes, definitely. Um, tell me about the people that you met, the projects you worked on, on Casting Call Club as a platform. Definitely, definitely. There's, there's so much. Two people that I've met that have been very supportive. They, they go by the name of uh, uh, Cross Paul Games and Morai Teru on uh, Twitter, and they handle the project Danganronpa F Shattered Hope. They have been very supportive. Everybody in that project has been supportive. I mean, I can mention the voice act, some of the voice actors, in, and I, I apologize if I forget someone's name <laughs> um, <laughs> because I'm nervous right now and I might may forget somebody's name. Voice actors like uh, Tunnelberg, Min, uh, Zell, Ryan, Ryan Zanon, my friend Ryan, he, um, he's doing good. Uh, Windlight Hub, um, others too, Kay, uh, they all do great voice acting, um, in that project. They're all very supportive. 
And of course, there's other projects that are supportive as well, but Morai Teru and Cross have been very supportive in their um, endeavors with us and with me have really, you know, boosted my confidence. And I bring up that project in particular because that was the first role that really told me that I could do this. Uh. Um, I had some some ups and downs thinking like, am I in the right field? Like, you know, I think I've opened up on Twitter a few times. Um, I will I will admit that of, you know, having confidence issues because I'm just not you uh, not used. I'm not saying I'm not used to, but I just, again, it's a complex of just rejection and such and failure. And I'm getting slowly getting over that because as an actor, that's, hmm. <laughs> you got to, you got to get used to it. I mean, people, yep. professionals or uh, people that you see, you know, let's say at Funimation or even in the commercial field or audiobook and narration field. I mean, you can get rejected 85% of the time and book 15% of your bookings of your projects. I mean, and 15 to 10 to 15%, that's, that's a positive. So, you know, I got to look at it like that and just know that failure is part of the, it's part of the field and you just have to take it with stride. Um, and I was, really having a hard time with that. But, you know, they, those two really have helped me get out of that. And I know I am not mentioning a lot of other people right now. And I just have to say like to everybody else that I'm not mentioning, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm, my head is going at a high rate right now. It's high, high speed and I'm also <laughs> tired. Um, I know June is tired probably right now as well. <laughs> um, but um, to everybody like that has helped and I've met you know, thank you. I appreciate you, you know, and I hope that we can work together in the future. I'm sure they understand. You know what I mean? They, um, Tell me about Pocket. Pocket. <laughs> <laughs> that laugh. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Pocket, boy. Pocket is, um, he's me. <laughs> Perfect. I, like, literally, like, it's just an exaggerated version of me. Um, In Danganronpa F. Shattered Hope. Just want to make that clear yes. for the audience. Pocket yes. is a character. Is a character, and um, I can't say who he is. I don't, honestly, I don't know who he is. <laughs> but all I know is that he's a goofball that doesn't want to be there, and that is just, again, he's me. That's all I got to say. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you had a lot of fun recording for Pocket. Oh, I did. I did. And as I mentioned to you before the podcast, like I got the Audient ID14. I'm trying to upgrade my uh, equipment. So by that point, like once I get a new mic and, you know, new audio box and all that kind of stuff, new new interface... I can really, really rev up like my emotions and such because the peaking <laughs> um, <laughs> as Pocket can get really loud. So, what has the uh, fans' reactions been like for Pocket? Uh, they've been like, "This boy is loud, and I like him." <laughs> <laughs> this boy is loud. I like him. He's a goofball. He is. Um, uh, he's he's the biggest idiot, and I love him. <laughs> <laughs> and what do people think about Pocket? And the voice acting. And the voice acting? The voice they think that the voice acting is on point. They think it's natural. They think that it's very exaggerated, very like in a good way, very exaggerated, yeah. very expressive. Um, and you know, going through learning more about acting, because I do like I have been playing I'm doing more acting classes, is um, you know, speaking your natural voice and speaking and acting, you know, from a base of just your neutral voice is good. Right. And I I try to do that with Pocket and because really his voice is just my voice in a higher tone and a higher like higher like register like ah, ah, you know just <laughs> yelling and all that kind of stuff but and you also play Zetsu in Lionheart Paragon what was what, tell me about that Lionheart Paragon is great the director for that is great Wing is amazing Wing Wolf you can see them on uh, Twitter but yeah they actually I don't know um just like Danganronpa F uh the story is um pretty much kind of like under the ropes a little bit. So I don't know a lot, but all I know is that Zetsu is an edgelord and I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love his attitude that I gave him. It's just a bad boy. What made you audition for Zetsu? <laughs> what made me audition for Zetsu? It's just the appeal. Um I just loved his look. Um I love the um the dark look. I always love the edgy the edgy type characters too. That's why like I really like Sasuke. 
And I was, <laughs> of course. Yeah. And, and and like he's not edgy, but I do like just like the not the sidekicks, but like the side main characters, honestly, like Vegeta and Bakugo and all those type of characters. So, you know, I, I look at Zetsu as one of those type of characters. So that's that's uh, that's the reason why. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm sure we can expect many more roles to come out of you Definitely. now and in the near future, I'm sure. Definitely. And um, of course, you know, I I do I do want to improve my um my setup here. It, it was a good startup setup, if that makes sense. Yeah. But um I of course once you you know, talking to a lot of the um a lot of the vets in the uh VA field, once you get higher in the tier, once you get higher in the uh and like what type of projects you want to do and and the type of seriousness you want to bring to the to you know to your craft yeah and voice acting you got to got to got to get better equipment learn more and just improve in, in a lot of different fields that's why you know i got to get a better interface got to get a better mic probably build a booth like a like a proper booth yeah and uh just go from there hmm. of course uh, and I hope that everybody's doing well during this quarantine. Um, I know it's hard, but while you know we are working remotely, everybody, I, this is the this is the right time, to, you know, to think about that kind of stuff. Speaking of work, actually, Josh, you're still working. You're working at the university that you attend, right? You're at uh, University of North Florida. Yes. And you're majoring in interdisciplinary studies focused on the eighth dimensions of wellness. Yes. What yes. is that? The eight dimensions of wellness. So I can't list them off all at all at one time because I know I'll forget <laughs> one. I think but, you should um, study harder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, I wanted to focus on something with health. And um, I will be honest, I was not good in public health. <laughs> um, I could not remember all the terms. Um, I am not perfect. What is eight dimensions of wellness? Eight dimensions of wellness is basically everything that you need to balance to have proper wellness. So like physical wellness, uh, spiritual wellness, uh, financial wellness, oh. um, all these sort of things. I kind of think of them as the infinity stones. Um, so <laughs> when, whenever you get all of them, then you just become freaking Thanos, I guess. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, when I was uh, studying it, you know, I would study like financial stuff. I would study, um, of course, study physical health, spiritual wellness, uh, social wellness. And throughout all this, I was also working at um, health promotions at UNF while I was there. So that kind of helped the cause wow. uh, while studying my major. Currently, I am graduated. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> um, the grind is over in school, but I do want to get my master's in the future if I ever can. I do want to get my master's. But uh yeah, currently right now I'm just a I'm just a welcome desk man, just a simple man who works at a desk. And um, when this uh, freaking quarantine goes down and COVID stops, I can get back to personal training. So you know the grind never stops. No, but I'm but I'm seeing a pattern here. Your your major in a field where you help people. Your job as a personal trainer to help people, your job as a front desk person to help people who are visiting. There's a theme here, Josh. There is. <laughs> there where is. does that where does that desire to want to help others? I'm sure a lot of it comes from uh, uh, childhood and your memories and your experience. But as an as an adult today, at age 25, where does that I, my question is, I guess, how has that evolved? It's not just about wanting to help people. What is it specifically today? It's just, it's funny. Um, it's just a certain feeling I get. It's like a certain satisfaction that you can't mimic. Um, the the enjoyment of just helping somebody and just making their day. It's just something that you can't really put into words. It's, it's something like, something that, as cheesy as it sounds, something that the heart can only answer. And it's it's just very nice. It's very fulfilling. It makes my day. It makes makes everything worth it. Hmm. You know, doing stuff for your for yourself, you know, that, that can go so far. Um Okay, I'm gonna stop you there for us. What is that in the background? That is a lawnmower. <laughs> Lawnmower. As everybody can um, can relate, um, I deal with lawnmowers, and I get very mad. Um, sometimes I yell in my booth. 
I, I go Super Saiyan, <laughs> and I, I think some of the VAs on Twitter have made uh, gifs or just little clips of them being mad at lawnmowers. So that is a lawnmower in the background, everybody. <laughs> oh my goodness! Um, it's yeah, it's it's funny. This is great. This is great background um, sound because this is what we deal with as voice actors: lawnmowers. <laughs> Josh, any plans to move to New York or LA? I want to. I know that one goal that Ryan and I have is moving to Texas or moving to anywhere that uh, where the work is. Because as a VA, yeah, I I totally believe um, that if you want to get prime work, you have to live where the work is. And um, yeah, I I do want to I do want to pursue that in some way. Um, I know right now, to be honest, probably not. Um, of course, not just with the quarantine, but just financially and um, just with the uh, foundation of knowledge that I have right now, it, it still needs to grow. Um, I am not ready. Yeah. Um, and that's humbling for me to say because I am the guy, type of guy that I have learned is very competitive and I can say like, I can go now. I can do it now. Like, yes, let's do it. That sort of thing. But I have began to learn uh, that sometimes you need to think it through, think it through and um, go slow because you don't want to like, you know, the best things sometimes take time uh, and you need to be patient. And I've always had a, uh, a problem with patience. So just taking it slow day by day, step by step, I know eventually that it will come. And if you're mentioning Texas as a, as a destination, I'm going to guess that's Funimation that you're aiming for. It is. It is. And and I have learned, too, that, uh, again, in the VA field, in the VO field, voiceover, basically, I mean, you have to be versatile. If you want to make this a career, you have to be versatile. You have to be open to doing commercials, audiobooks, different things besides animation and such, because, I mean, it can be very hard to just, you know, make a, an honest living just doing voiceover at times. I mean, because some... Is that how you feel? Um, That is that is how I feel. I mean, I hope, like, it'd be great if I'm proven wrong. I'd be like, oh, shoot, I can just do video game character voices. Awesome. Sweet. But from, a, from what I've heard from a lot of people is like, you know, you have to be open to do other things as well Um, to just make it a full-time, you know, gig, like audiobooks, uh, narrations, um, commercials, just uh, and also video game and anime and different shows, cartoons, all that kind of stuff. And what are some short term and long term? I mean, long term is obviously Funimation and LA and larger projects and whatnot, union agents, right? What are some steps have you set for yourself in order to get you there? Steps, definitely. It's funny. I was just talking with a friend uh, last night about it, and of course, get a better interface, get a better mic. Learn more about the audio. Um, I am not the best with audio, and it's very immature of me to not be knowledge in that. So I have to, you know, immerse myself in just studying about that kind of stuff. Get a better booth, really. Start to make more connections within the field of, um, you know, not only not only video games and, and anime and such, but you know, commercial and a narration and all that kind of stuff. Because I do like that. I do like that stuff too. The commercial and narration stuff. Yeah. Um, I also, you know, just make connections outside of voice acting as well. Um, I will name drop here. Um, I am a <laughs> part of a um, acting agency here in Jacksonville. It's called Third Man Entertainment. And it's run by my acting manager, um, Jared Rush. He's a great, amazing man. He's Irish. <laughs> um, uh, he's great he's fantastic fantastic dude he's helped me out for the past two years now and um, of course we can't work right now because of the quarantine and it's just hard to um, he's learning more about the uh, the VO field um, so we're kind of going you know at a at a good pace right now of just learning and then also finding bookings all that kind of stuff but yeah I'm under his agency and um just finding more work, just auditioning, 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 learning. And as time goes on, just like set other goals too. Like I want to get in a big time narration gig or try to get in two commercials within, within the next two months, like voiceover commercials and stuff like that. Also little goals too, like every week, you know, 
make sure to do at least five to 10 auditions, you know, throughout the week, um, just to keep yourself on your toes. Because the more you audition, the more experience you get. And, you know, it's again, audition, audition, audition. I've heard, I've had a lot of people come to me, talk to me and say, I don't know if this is right for me. I can't get this role or I can't get this, this certain project or anything like that. I'm like, I'm learning too, y'all. And it can be rough. It can be cutthroat, but that's just a part of the business. I mean, you're going to get rejected 85 to 90% of the time. Um, More like 95, actually. Yeah, or 95. (laughs) And the roles that you do get, it just makes it even sweeter. So um, that's the beauty of it. There's a a sadness to it and a beauty to it. Um, And it's hard to handle at times, but hey, uh, you just got to keep auditioning. Let's wrap this up a little bit here. In the questionnaire that you filled out Mm -hmm. that everybody else does, you specifically requested some time. Uh, for you to give some space and time to talk about your your faith in God. Here you go. It's hard. It is hard. I, again, I am not perfect. It's, it's um, I've spoken about it throughout the whole podcast, but, um, you know, I am on and off with going to church. I get mad at God. I sometimes do not like him um, for whatever reason you know, all the stuff that he, you know, the path or the choices or anything. And right now, I, again, I, I sound selfish saying all that, but I guess I wanted to say that on here and be open with all of that because, you know, we're not all perfect. And I feel, you know, saying that and being open with it can really help others because uh, they can be held to a standard with, you know, believing in a, in a religion or with God and, and it can be definitely hard during these times that we're in right now. It can be easy to say, why did God do this to us? Why is he doing this to us? Like, why is he making people sick? Um, and not just with COVID, just with any disease, really. Why is he doing this to us? And, and it's, again, easy for me to say, but I guess I'm saying it too right now to kind of make me realize is... It's not, you know, God did not do this to, to us. He did not. He's supporting us right now. He's, you know, he's looking down on us. And whatever his plan is, we just have to trust it. And throughout my life, I know that even though it's been hard at times, you know, I've had to, you know, rely on him to get me through those really bad times. I guess the last character I'll reference to is um, Edmund Dantes from The Count of Monte Cristo. I remember him talking to the priest in the Chateau d'If. And he's just like, God does not exist in this place, priest, or something like that. And that man goes through a whole revenge plot in the whole movie or whole book. And by the end, when everything is settled down and such, he finally gets to see like, Everything that has been given or everything that has happened, um, it can be used for good. So anything that has happened or is happening now, it is not in our control, but we have to use the experiences that God gives us and use it in a positive manner, whether it be to fix something, whether it be to mend something, whether it be to help somebody, we just have to be positive and look ahead and you know, trust in him. Now, I'm not particularly religious in mm-hmm. any capacity, and I'm, I'm just nev- I'm just not. <laughs> That's fine. But I have respect for every religion, and every person of faith and, and background and everything else. We're human beings. I'm a humanist, if that's yeah. a thing. Um, and I'm going to agree with that part about being positive and being supportive, especially through this difficult time so that we can all come out uh, at the end sane and loving instead of divided and hating. Yes. It would just uh, you know, Sometimes you got to adapt. Sometimes you have to, <laughs> again, going back to guts now is... Struggle on, <laughs> struggler. <laughs> that's that's literally what it is. You just got to struggle on. Like, yeah. keep going, grind. And um, of course, work smarter, not harder. Um, sometimes working hard can be can make you do stupid things like it did with me. So I would definitely say to people, work smarter, not harder at times. Um, you'll have your moments where you can work hard, um, but work smarter, not harder. Trust in God, trust the process. And um, it'll be good. 
Okay, well, tell us about some of the projects that you're struggling on currently. What's coming out right now? What's coming out soon? Oh, man. So a lot of stuff um, is always in post-production or is always in production. Of course, there's Danganronpa F. Cybermania is a new one um, that I'm a part of. Um, I'm Tesla was able to uh, get that role. That was pretty cool. Uh, there's Lion, Lionheart Paragon. There's Once More, where I, where I play as the character Boss. And um, that's in Kickstarter right now. What else is there? My uh, There is this cool, cool... Uh, there's this uh, visual novel I'm a part of. It's called um, Everstory. It's a, it's a um, little visual novel that I'm a part of. And I play as the character Jack. That, that's fun. And... Um, there's one more that I'm a little, that, not little, but I'm excited about. Uh, I always like My Hero Academia, and there's this fan project that I'm a part of uh, that's really cool, and I play a few characters in that. It's basically it's a fan dub, basically, but it's a it's an independent game that's being worked on. So cool. There's that, but I do plan on uh you know getting into more of the uh, uh, narration and uh, um, audiobook type of stuff as well. Again being versatile, learning to be versatile, learning that there's more outlets, learning how the, like the overall business of voiceovers go, you know, uh, presenting yourself in a professional manner, which you always have to do, of course. And, uh, you know, having certain demos, like commercial demos, narration demo, um, character demo, uh, raw acting demo, uh, where you're just not, you're not doing any character voices, just going straight off of the, you know, of your acting ability, I guess. But yeah, just immersing myself. Again, this is a time skip uh, arc <laughs> that I'm in right now. <laughs> you have to learn and be humble about it, which grinds my gears at times because I'm just like, I just want to go, but you can't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, training and preparation and patience, I think most of all are necessary things in this industry and for everybody's growth. Definitely. And if any casting directors or producers or companies that are listening to this right now and they go, that guy would be really nice for my narration, where can they go to find you? <laughs> well, uh, they can find me on Twitter under um, at Josh Portillo. That is me. And then um, on SoundCloud, I have a few of my um, my uh, recordings on there as well. Uh, Josh Portillo is also the name of my profile on SoundCloud. Um, I will say I have a lot more animation character driven recordings right now but I do plan on you know doing more of the raw uh narration stuff in the future as well um got to get more material in that to show the versi- versatility or if that's even a word or the uh, <laughs> um yeah all around all around work that I can do so very good very good and I sincerely, just uh, from the bottom of my heart, sincerely <laughs> do hope and wish you success and wellness as you continue on your journey. I think there's, I think there's going to be really interesting and rewarding things waiting for you. You know, in the near future, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer of good things happening to good people. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. And yes. Um, as as long as you as as you continue on your journey in this positive and 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 real and raw way, just as you are, Josh Portillo, I really think that good things are on the horizon. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. And and again, I'm I, really proud of you. Thank I you. And I uh, I think I could say for all of the um because uh, we we uh we see each other on Twitter a lot. Um, that's where a lot of the VAs are really that we see. I think. Um, I can speak for all of them that, uh, you know, we thank you for being the uh, role model to all of us and, you know, really giving us an outlet to talk and all that kind of stuff. Because um, it can be hard to not, you know, open up at times on this sort of outlet and you're giving us that um, and you're always, you know, very helpful and such and um, give us that friendly spirit that really lifts our spirits up. And, um, you know, I think I can speak for all of us you know, all of us youngins that we can say thank you for giving us all that. Once a teacher, always a teacher. I'm just <laughs> scratching my selfish itches of wanting to help others. <laughs> it's all for me. It's not about you. Oh, <laughs> damn. <laughs> oh, no, he said it. <laughs> Josh, thank you very much for your time this morning. Yes, it sir. was a great conversation. I learned a lot more about you and it was it was it was refreshing 
Even though the topic may have been a little a bit dark, it was really refreshing, and I'm really glad to have found out more about you. Thanks yes, for sir. sharing your story. No problem. I hope uh, people can see that their story does not have to be bleak. It does not have to be dark. You just gotta you gotta change. Sometimes you gotta change the tone. Um, hmm. And uh, struggle on, strugglers. <laughs> struggle on, struggler. I think that'll be the theme of this podcast episode. That's awesome. <laughs> <sighs> yes. All right, Josh. Thank you again very much. And I'll see you on Twitter. Yes, sir. Peace. This has been Voice Actor Showcase. Visit our website at voiceactorshowcase.com. If you'd like to be featured on this podcast, contact us at voiceactorshowcase.com. Thanks for listening. Hello. My name is Eric Howell, and I'm the podcast editor for Voice Actor Showcase. Oh, whoa. Hey, get back. I'm, I'm trying to make a commercial here. <laughs> Anyways, if you have a podcast that needs editing or you would like to make a voice acting demo reel, you can reach me at thepodcastdoctor at gmail.com and I'll be with you right after I slay this dragon. No, you! Come back here! <laughs> <laughs>